Welcome back. We want to thank you again for joining us today for this Overcoming Allergies Conference. We are excited to get into the afternoon session with Dr. Henry Wright. So remember to put away all distractions and stay tuned for testimonies and special offers. Psychogenic allergies. <laughs> oh boy. In the case of Miss Sunita, um, I wanted to prove to her that I could create allergies by the power of suggestion. No way possible. Because a person who has allergies are convinced they're really allergic to the item that they're exposed to. So how could I get past that mindset? Well, God has lots of ways of helping us think. And so one day, one of the things that Miss Anita was, said she was allergic to was pesticides. Because she had been told that's what caused her problem. So we were on the um, second floor of this building doing ministry. And I casually walked over to the window and then I exclaimed in horror, Oh no! The Orkin man is here! I told him never to come here again! He's going to spray the lawn for bugs! Just like that, she had an allergic reaction and went catatonic. <laughs> when she came out of the catatonic state, I looked at her and said, Miss Anita, there was no orchid man. You had a physiological manifestation based on fear alone, phobia. And I was able to prove it. Something else I did to her. She was so mad at me. She came with this whole bunch of syringes, adrenaline stuff. So when she came, she, I went and hid them. She was always looking for her syringes. She couldn't find them. I just said, I don't know, I don't know where they are. They must be somewhere. She never used them. I think she maybe eventually forgave me of that. But part of defeating fear is facing it. And... Um, if you have a fear, you will avoid it. If you have an itch, you'll scratch it. <laughs> we all have, we all have our, our ways of uh, coping. Um, Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Luke 6, 45 says, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Mark 7, 21 through 23, is really a very good scripture to help understand this battle. Jesus is the author. Jesus says, It's not what goes in the mouth and comes out charming land is what defiles the man. Well, that's my paraphrase, Mr. Whipple. But what Jesus said is this, for from within, out of the heart of man, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. And defile the man. We've mentioned this scripture so many times. In 2 Corinthians 10.5. Is that you're to hold every thought captive. Do you do inventory of your personality? Sometimes we avoid our personality because there's stuff in there we don't want to admit we have. We don't want to face the things in our life that aren't good. We go into denial. But the people around us know we have it. 
because it's it's manifesting in our lives and how we think and how we speak and how we act so part of your journey is being able to discern what is of god and what is not of god it's a sign of maturity a sign of maturity is found in hebrews chapter 5 that talks about being able to discern the difference between good and evil. That's part of your maturity. But we have such a fear of the negative. We have such a fear of evil. We're so superstitious. And so we, we become like the ostrich or the emu, they tell me. That one, I don't know which is which anymore. It depends if you're in Australia or you're wherever you are. Is there a difference? They say there is between an emu and an ostrich, but they're this bird with a long, scrawny neck and a big butt. That's how I can tell them. And a beak. And they, they tell me that when one of these birds gets startled, it puts its head in the sand. Because it has this bird brain thought that if it can't see you, you can't see it. But what it doesn't know, the biggest part of it sticking straight up in the air. So, so denial may make you a bigger target than the beak and the two little eyes looking at your enemy. <laughs> I love Hebrews chapter 4. I think I'm going to take time to look it up. Uh, that's the New Testament, if you're looking in Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, you guys are a great audience. And those of you who are live streaming around the world, thanks for your patience. Hebrews chapter 4 says, For the word of God is quick, and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Bring that chart back up, precious. Spirit, soul, body. So the Word of God is able to separate how you think. Let's read this again is able to separate the soul and the spirit. So the soul is a different part of you than your spirit. They're not the same. They're those that teach otherwise. This obviously doesn't. They're two separate compartments of your creation. So you may be thinking this way, but the Word of God, which is spirit, when you read it and embrace it, actually becomes part of your spirit because it's reinforced by the Holy Spirit, which is he's to lead you into all truth from the inner parts, the inner man. But your poor head, which is comprised of your long-term memory, is pretty slow. Now you have a battle. You have a battle between truth and the opposite. What are you going to do with that? So the Word of God is able to help you understand truth. Because the Word of God is truth. And any thought that you have that does not match the Word of God, and all due respect to you, is a form of ignorance and insanity. You cannot have the mind of Christ and follow the law of sin. They're diametrically opposed to each other. The law of sin represents the overthrow of God in creation. The law of God represents the continuum or the preservation of creation. And so, the Word of God, which is truth, is able to drop a plumb line. So when you're going to defeat these allergies and these phobic allergies, 
you're going to have to decide the symptoms may not be telling you the truth. Now, I didn't finish showing you about the hypothalamus. It's so boring, I won't go there again. But the hypothalamus is either working for you or against you. You need your body to serve you. Please help it. And you help it by having good thinking. And you can have good thinking while bad thinking is still talking to you. You can forgive somebody while unforgiveness is screaming in your head. You can walk in faith when fear is demanding your attention. But I have to tell you that it comes through practice. And practice does make perfect. So over here in Hebrews, so the Word of God is able to divide your thinking on two levels, soul and spirit. And of the joints and the marrow. Isn't it amazing we took you to the marrow today? And we showed you from the word of God what would be destroying your marrow, your immune system. And what was it? Fear, by which releases cortisol, making you susceptible to excessive B-cell activity, which is what allergies are. And not only that, making sure that if you get cancer, you can't defeat it. When God created your body, if you're walking in the truth of peace of God, that God created your body to identify every cancer cell that would come and eat it before it forms a tumor, and that's what you've got to bank on. And if you've got the tumor, then get the stuff out of your life that's causing fear to continue to rule. That'll shut down the cortisol drip. Your immune system will begin to heal. And I have evidence of many case histories where the immune system would destroy even tumors until they were gone. Now this is, this is cutting edge material you're hearing. And it's necessary. The church should have been taught this for centuries. But it didn't even know it has a problem. No, it doesn't. It may not be more faith you need. It may be more repentance to God you need. About the things in your life that are not of God. I'm not trying to burden you with the teachings of sanctification but they're not taught like they need to be. You see, if you get into the teaching of sanctification, the whole field of PPS or pneumopsychosomatology, the whole field of what I'm talking about is found in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Sanctification is taught right in one verse. It says, may the God of peace. So where does peace come from? God or Prozac? Drugs. Uppers, downers, in-betweeners. Upper lifters. Peace comes from God. That's why Jesus is called the Prince of Peace for a reason. Perfect peace belongs to those whose minds are fixed or stayed on the Lord. And who is the Lord? The word of the living Father of all spirits. That's where your sanity is. Having the mind of Christ is your health. You can take the word evil. Turn it around, it spells live. Get the evil out of your life, you shall live. 
It's that'll teach in the whole Bible. I want to live. This is my generation. I've had stuff in my life I've had to repent for. My life depends on me being able to be changed. Even to, as I speak to you, there are areas that are under construction. Excuse my dust, remodeling in progress. But I got it. And I understand my responsibility. And I re understand what this is about. So I don't teach you something I haven't had to walk and live. This is not a theory. This is a matter of life or death. And I shall live and not die before my time to declare the glories of my God. Count me in. I'm not opting out. So when I'm getting too old, you need to repent. You're never old. You're eternal. Whether you live or whether you die, you're the Lord's. Get up. Get yourself right about here. So come on, Henry. Get up, man. Let's go. Got work to do in Jesus' name. That's what I have to do every day. My body doesn't rule me. It's designed to serve me. But I have things that I have to do to make sure it's healthy. And it's more than eating okra. E Hebrews. In uh, the joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Scripture helps me understand what's right or wrong, what's truth or error, what's sanity or insanity. Helps keep my head straight. Now, First Thessalonians 5.23, I almost forgot to finish that one. May the God of peace sanctify you wholly. The word holy there is not H-O-L-Y, but the word sanctify represents H-O-L-Y. What's found in the King James is different than the NIV, which is a mess, because it totally changes the conclusion. But in the King James it says this, may the God of peace sanctify you wholly. The word holy is W-H-O-L-L-Y. So could I say it this way? May the God of peace make you holy that you can be made whole. I'm going to say it again. May the God of peace make you holy that you can be made whole. And that you be preserved blameless. That means the enemy has, may tempt you, but he has no right to touch you. That you be preserved blameless in spirit and soul and body, all three parts. Most of the Christians are going to wellness centers, but you won't find any wholeness centers. You don't find anybody with a shingle up saying, Welcome to my wholeness center. I'll tell you who the wholeness center was designed to be by God was the local church. And it's not a wholeness center across America. It's barely a halfway house. As we're suffering. Hoping to die to go to a place called heaven to escape this planet. When we were called to stay here and represent God and make a difference. 
I'm not in a hurry to leave this planet. It'd be unprofitable for mankind if I left. Because you need people like me to challenge you, exhort you, and point you in the right direction. That's truth. I'm your cheerleader. I'm your life coach for him. That's what a pastor does. Doesn't build great cathedrals and preach long sermons. You ought to read what the pastor is supposed to do in Jeremiah. He said to give you pastors according to his own heart that would feed you with knowledge and with understanding. That's who I am as a pastor. To feed you with knowledge and with understanding that your highway would be clear before you and your faith would not be shipwreck. Get out of your superstition. Get back into faith. What's faith? Things you're hoping for. Now over here, I want to read one more thing. In Hebrews chapter 4, I don't think most of Christianity even understands what this means, but I'm going to help you because I'm supposed to give you understanding, right? I'll try. Verse 13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now, what do you think is the creature that you can't see but the Lord knows exists? that the word of God will discern. What's that creature? It's your enemy that answers to Satan, the principalities, the powers, the spiritual wickedness, the rulers of the darkness of this planet, that kingdom that fell with Satan, that answers to him, that gives you thoughts and tempts you. You need to know that kingdom is there and how it talks to you. You need to have discernment. For example, we've given you the proof today from Job that a spirit of fear is an invisible evil spirit, not an emotion. It can produce an emotion, as you would call it in humanology, but the source of thought is not you, the source of thought is a spirit of fear which has been talking to you, but you didn't hear its voice. You felt its impressions because it speaks to you as if it were you. Wanting to live vicariously. I was so impacted by our uh, triple program this week for my life, for the children. They were doing a skit helping the children understand how evil spirits influence them, gets them in trouble. And I was listening to the skit, and one of my pastors emailed me and said, what do you think about this? I'll tell you what impacted me about this skit, is they had a picture of a person holding things called like unforgiveness. And the person was being asked to repent for embracing unforgiveness as part of their personality. And they didn't want to. They wanted to hang on to that record of wrongs. But it was back and forth. And finally, in the skit, the person decides to forgive. And the minute they forgave, the person disappeared and the card that they were holding that said unforgiveness fluttered to the floor without the person, and a voice is heard saying in the skit on the camera, you spirit of unforgiveness, wander the earth without a body. I said, my God, this is good. Wander the earth without a human body that you can speak through. This is the greatest thing you could do, is remove a member of that kingdom into its dry place, that you could go free 
and let it wander the earth because it has no way of fulfillment unless it uses you to live vicariously through. And when you allow it to use your faculties to live vicariously through you, God holds you responsible for allowing something that was judged to have its life in creation again, but uses you to do it. Folks, this is not Sunday School 101. This is maturity. I'm not interested in being a puppet on a string for an invisible kingdom. I'm the one that's in charge in Jesus' name. Jesus gave the planet to us, took it back from the devil. Why don't we believe that? Why don't we tell that kingdom fear that's producing your allergies and your asthmas and so on that you're not going to listen to it anymore. You're going to command it to go to its dry place in Jesus' name. And when it comes back, you've got a big sign over your spirit that says no vacancy. But we're not taught this kind of warfare. We're not taught how to take ownership of our lives. We're just suffering for Jesus. Sad. Just saying. If you don't like fear, then get rid of it. Well, I'm in trouble now with some audiences. The Father wants you to know the creature that only the Word of God can reveal. Here it comes. God has not given you the spirit of fear. If God didn't give you the spirit of fear, then who gave it to you? The enemy did, and you bought the lie. Then you made it part of your personality. Now your body is just conforming to the image of death, not life. Choose this day what you shall have. Life or death. You've got to decide which law you live by. Well, I'm preaching now. I've got to stop. Some of the abstracts I'm reading here is psychogenic influences are associated with allergic disorders. It is therefore important for physicians to become aware of clinical nuances related to psychological influences that can help facilitate proper diagnosis and management of these conditions. Familiarity with the differential diagnosis of allergic versus non-allergic or vasomotor rhinitis are important. Like, for example, psychogenic sneezing is an example of a common psychologically triggered symptom that mimics an allergic reaction. In fact, it's not. And then you have, then we've learned something else, that manifestations of sneezing can be cross-pollinated with other humans. We all start sneezing. Then we get into hay fever, and, or we get into the spring pollen time. You are allergic to pollen because you expect to be allergic to it. Your trained phobic in your body responds. Now, some of you will disagree with that. Then you figure it out. I don't come with an opinion, folks. I come with years of case histories and wins. And the only people that didn't win this one are people that would not embrace change. The psychological burden of patients with food allergies should be considered, including the effects of psychological conditioning on promoting more food allergies simply to the process of thought. Psychogenic influences. I'll skip through some of this uh, dealing with 
epilepsy and, and seizures that seem to be epilepsy but are not. Uh, we won't get into that because you, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty involved. I got some case histories, but time is of the essence. Phobias. Phobias are quite important to psychogenic allergies. You have to really take a lesson from the word, especially about fear. If I were to take you to Job again, I would tell you what Job said. I wasn't looking for trouble, but it came anyway. And then Job said, the thing that I have feared greatly has come upon me. What you fear is headed your way. Fear is a powerful form of Satan's belief system. Faith, Hebrews 11.1, 1, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence not yet seen. Fear is the substance of things not hoped for, the evidence not yet seen. Fear and faith are equal in this dimension. This is very important what I'm telling you. Fear and faith are equal in this dimension. Both project into the future and both demand to be fulfilled. Could I say, according to Scripture, according to your faith, so be it unto you. Could I say then, according to your fear, so be it unto you. We are trained through our five physical senses and also through the fears of others who are phobic. You have to be careful who you hang out with. Many people get problems because other people have them and want you to believe you're getting them. So you cross-pollinate each other with fear. It creates a mass hysteria, a mass phobic, mass meme of thought that demands that you know you are a statistical casualty also. Phob phobic neuroses. Anxiety involves projection and displacement. The pro this is read out of a DSM-5. This is a Merck manual of, that doctors use. It also can be found in the DSM-5 manual. Is that fear will cause you to project. Remember what I said? Fear demands to be fulfilled. Projects into the future. That's read out of Merck. Projection. You're being conditioned for the result of fear. Your enemy is very skillful of giving you his blessings or the opposite of God's blessings. And if you study the word, you'll find God will let, won't stop the enemy from blessing you with his diseases. If you want to follow the law of sin, God's not going to do one thing to stop you. So you better ask God to convict you, at least the Holy Spirit to talk to you, because God does not want to share you with the enemy. But the choices you make, I want to tell you something, the choices you make, even God is at the mercy of your decision. And I'll tell you something else that's very therapeutic. So isn't the devil in his kingdom at the mercy of your decision. Both sides are waiting for you to choose. It's that simple. Then comes the displacement or the avoidance, like an agoraphobia. Yet somebody that has this fear, they have a fear of man. You like the Kmart blue, blue light specials. Maybe the Kmart's not in your town anymore, but historically they've been there. And you 
you ding a ling call this person on the phone and say, I'm going down to Kmart. To, they got a blue light special. You get stuff at 50 to 60% off. Why don't you come with me? But when you get there, there's 500 people bound, banging on the doors trying to get in to get in and get this product. It's like, you know, it's like the Christmas rush, the Black, what's it, Black Friday or whatever it's called. Black, whatever it's called. Black Sabbath. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> it's a ritual. And all of a sudden, you get in there, you feel trapped, you start to hyperventilate, there's a sweat comes, you get brain fog, you've got to get out of there, and you run out and say, i got to go to the bathroom. You lied. And you run out, and all of a sudden, all the symptoms leave. You're being conditioned for agoraphobia. So you go home. You breathe in, breathe out. Whew, I survived that one. Whew. Next month, your friend calls and says, Hey, I got another blue light special. Man, they got some hot deals. Let's go. And you say, Well, <clears throat> sorry, I I've got a fever. You lied. Already you got sweat. Already you're trembling. Already you've got brain fog. Already you're hyperventilating. And you opt out. And then you have fear of crowds forever and forever and forever until somebody brings you truth about your life. It isn't the crowds, it's fear. This is classic. Time Magazine. I wish I, I said my archives, I didn't have time to find it, but in my archives I've got Time Magazine for a few years ago that identified all the phobias that Americans deal with. There's seven pages, over 7,000 phobias that Americans deal with. My favorite one in Time Magazine was, uh, oh, I just drew a blank on it, was, uh, oh, I forget the name of it, but it's Fear of Sermons. There are people in America that have fear or are phobic about sermons. And I forget, I'll think of it later. But small print, seven pages, Americans. When you get into phobias, they're either real or they're imagined. Psychogenic allergies are the product of imagined. Then you get around an item that you're afraid of and you have a hypersensitivity or you have a physiological manifestation which could be no different than redness on your skin, itching, confusion, and it reinforces the fact that that is, you're allergic to it. And from that point, you avoid it. You're so easy. What have I told you that 70% of all allergies are an illusion? You're not really allergic to anything. But you're the product of excessive B-cell activity coming out of fear, producing antibodies. You've been missing out on a lot of things that were good for you. Julia, it's good to have the things to eat, and, and our brother, it's good to have things to eat, and, and I'm full gospel because I eat what I want. Low sodium. I'm uh, doing well, thank you. But I am down 45 pounds from five years ago. So I'm... Phobias. Sometimes there can be an increased, and listen to this, this is light begets like. Family 
connections. An increased allergic response is seen in young children whose primary caregivers perceive their lives as stressful or out of control. So you have a child, you have a, a caregiver comes in, but the caregiver is out of control, is fearful and stressed out and hovering over everything. The child will develop allergies because their caregiver is not at peace. As I began my journey in multiple allergies many years ago, I went to a house near San Diego in which the woman was severely MCSEI. And she had two children, ages four and six, that were severely allergic. When her husband picked me up at the airport, LAX, and I arrived at the home, we opened the refrigerator door and had no food in it. Carousels of homeopathic remedies. Side vials of homeopathic remedies. Outside refrigerator in the garage, more vials. Every morning this woman would get, get up she and her two children would take between 40 and 70 drops of homeopathic drops. I walked into a stressed home. I won't give you the full story, but it's an interesting one. But five days later, the woman was totally well of all allergies and her children when I left in five days. The big story about this, the children were so allergic that they couldn't spend time with their cousins. And one of the cousins was having a birthday party, but the children coming up with the, that while I was there was going to happen that weekend. The children weren't going to be allowed to go because there was carpet on the floor. They're going to be having unsafe foods. And the mother, fearful, did not want her children and so the children are going to believe it's unsafe too. Until the mother was healed and the children were healed. And I remember the story of these children going to this cousin's home for a birthday party, eating ice cream and pie and cake or anything, and playing on the carpet and doing everything, and came back home with not one allergic reaction. And that entire family was healed in five days when they dealt with fear. I've got the war stories. I've seen God do the successes. So I don't have an opinion. I have a victory after victory that he has done. They called upon the name of the Lord in Psalm 34. And he delivered them of all of their fears. Joel, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Today we're going to call upon the name of the Lord before we leave here to deliver us of our fears. Some of you have come with allergies and allergic manifestations. We want the Father to come in Jesus' name. Here's another one. Women with an intolerance to chemicals, especially chemical odors, have an amplified blood pressure response to stress or chemical exposure compared to women who do not report such problems. These women also tended to have higher levels of life stress, past abuse, and a poor relationship with their father, reports Dr. Iris Bell, one of the top EI doctors in America. This is older material. I don't know what she's doing today. But this was published in November issue of the Journal of Women's Health. This included disorders such as chronic fatigue syndrome, sick building syndrome, and fibromyalgia also fit into the profile. Women with chemical intolerance had the highest levels of life stress and past abuse, similar to those with depression. However, women with chemical intolerance had the weakest relationship with their father 
than of all women. I'm going to skip through some of this stuff. Peanuts. Now I'm going to hide when I teach this down here where, behind the bulletproof plexiglass. I'm just the reporter. I'm the roving reporter today. Be nice to me. Peanut allergy. Wikipedia. Peanut allergy is a type of food allergy to peanuts. It is different from nut allergies. Physical. Some reactions have been noted to be psychogenic in nature. Isn't it amazing I'm using this word today? First is traditional IgE rest. The second psychogenic. In the result of conditioning and belief system that produces the allergy rather than a true chemical reaction from the peanut itself. This is from a doctor. Food allergy hysteria is nuts. Now, I'm not trying to be insensitive. I've dealt with people with allergies and fear that, that go catatonic and are capable of going into anaphylaxis, which they could die. So I'm not being insensitive, but neither am I backing away from it. Because the people that used to go into anaphylaxis and into catatonia are normal today. If I'd backed away, they'd still be sick. Because I'm going to take you to your enemy. If you want to go, we'll go back to the prison house. Concerning food, and that includes peanuts, there's nothing evil in itself. I keep a bag of pistachio nuts going all the time on my kitchen counter. Low sodium. Let me read it. Peanut allergy is the most common cause of death due to foods, according to the Asman Allergy Foundation of America. The hysteria itself, now I'm just reading this, just relax. The hysteria itself is nuts. In fact, the bans may worsen the very problem they aim to address. This is coming from Harvard Medical School, which is not known for quackery, not necessarily. And this is published in the British Medical Journal. Measures to control nuts are instead making things worse the cycle of overreaction and increasing sensitization. He calls the, I can't read this word, I guess it looks like prohibition of nuts, part of a mass psychogenic illness. Here's the word again. A mass psychogenic or phobic illness, which is used to be identify Epidemic hysteria involving otherwise healthy people in a cascade of anxiety. Nobody knows why the number is growing, but some researchers speculate that as other threats to the human immune system are removed from the playing field by antibacterial soap. And by the way, if you want to get infections, continue to use antibacterial soap. You're phobic. If you want to get infections, you got to eat a dollar's worth of dirt before you die. You might as well start now. And if you keep, try to keep your children in a sterile atmosphere to protect them from this and that, they will be the sickest kids on the block. Because your immune system needs the exposure to everything in order to how to protect you. So, the threats to the human immune system are removed from the playing field by antibacterial soap and other modern techniques. The immune system needs something to do, so it attacks the offbeat proteins in peanuts because, it's, really, it's bored. You're too sterile. Needs something to do. So we'll pick on peanuts. And other foods that many people are known to be sensitive to 
in a nutshell, as explained in an article in the New York Times this week, the latent potential for a particular allergen becomes manifest, the thinking goes. Other studies have generated mounting evidence that this is true for other types of allergies. Avoiding germs can prevent the spread of disease, but too much cleanness seems to breed more allergies. Fear doesn't like me talking right now. Meanwhile, this is called the school charade. Meanwhile, the efforts to make schools nut free, therefore safe, is a charade. For starters, he calls it a gross overreaction to the magnitude of the threat. About 3.3 million Americans are allergic to nuts. More are allergic to other foods, from milk to wheat. 6.9 million are allergic to seafood. Serious allergic reactions to food, all foods, cause roughly 2,000 hospitalizations a year. But we didn't stop eating seafood. We didn't stop eating wheat or milk. What do you want to do? Remove everything from the planet so that we can die of starvation? He goes on. There is evidence, however, that avoiding nuts makes children ultimately more likely to be allergic to them. Why? Because the immune system doesn't recognize them. A study of 10,000 children in the UK, reported earlier this year in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, found that early exposure to peanuts reduces the risk of peanut allergies. Let me read this again. Study of 10,000 kids, UK. That early exposure to peanuts reduces the risk of peanut allergies. The wholesale avoidance of nuts contributes to the problem by resulting in children who, lacking exposure to nuts, are actually sensitized to them to have more and more reactions. However, well-intentioned efforts to reduce exposure to nuts actually fan the flames since they signal to parents that nuts are a clear and present danger. This encourages more parents to worry, which fuels the epidemic. It also encourages more parents to have their children tested, thus detecting mild and meaningless allergy to nuts. And this encourages still more avoidance of nuts, learning to more sensitization and more phobic thinking. Is David Levitt available? I'm calling David Levitt, calling the universe. I think it's time right now. We're looking at our time here. We want to be done. I think David's got a testimony that would be important to at this point. Since we're talking about oversensitization, we're talking about an atmosphere of a phobic atmosphere. David, you and I have interacted about your family. I'll wait till you get here so I can talk about you on camera for those that are watching around the world. But as a member of our team, you and I have had some conversations in your journey with, with you and your wife, Cassie. Yep about your children, and you shared a testimony of the day. But just this week, I became real bold with you. You did. And I went someplace that you really didn't want me to go. I would say that, because I asked you. Well, but <laughs> you were being nice. But what you knew you had to do would be very difficult. Yeah. Well, it would have been if you didn't understand. Yeah. You want to share both cases? Sure. Well, the the first case was with our oldest daughter, Brooke, who's uh, eight now. But when she was under a year old, um, she developed some pretty bad seasonal allergies. So her eyes were always getting kind of, you know, the, the gunky stuff and it would dry. And sometimes she would sleep and she couldn't open her eyes because it was matted shut and sneeze. Just, she just was always kind of her face was always kind of wet. I mean, when you when you think about it, it's kind of gross, but that's how it, it always was. And so we, um, my wife and I thought, oh, well, you know, here's some allergies. And, and we were trying to, you know, understand allergies and deal with the fear in our life and thought as we dealt with that, things would get better, but they weren't getting better. And so uh, we, you know, met with you and Pastor Donna one day. And um, you asked us a lot of questions about different things, but you said, what are you doing about the allergies? Like, are you treating it in any kind of way? 
And we said, oh, well, here, yeah, let's go down the list. We give her baby Claritin. We don't let her go outside. There, there was cat dander, you know, in the, in the carpets where we moved into. And we're considering ripping that up and putting down new flooring. And, and so we were make, taking, like, all these measures to try to control and protect my child, you know. And, uh, you know, you, you looked at me and said, hmm, is it? You think it's possible that maybe you're afraid of her reactions to the environment? And we pretty much knew right away, well, yeah, that's true. And so we, we simply went home, repented. Uh, we decided that we were going to let this child be a child. We weren't going to have her avoid anything if she was sneezy and all this stuff. Well, so be it. We we're going to trust God. And I had prayed for her a lot of times. I honestly was a little bit tired of doing it. And... So I said, I'm going to pray for her one more time because we've, we may have found a block here. And so I prayed and I said, that's it. And we're just going to let this thing go and see what happens. Well, in a month, she was completely healed of allergies. And I say a month because I was waiting a month to see if it really took. Okay. So <laughs> in other words, what, what I'm hearing him say, he created a phobic environment that was transferring to his children. Yeah, and so come to present day, uh, you know, kind of happened again. We didn't realize we went right there. But um, we have four children, and I have a, a son who's four now. And whenever he would eat peanut butter or, or honey, he would get diarrhea, okay? And so... Our solution was just not give it to him. Maybe he's just little and his little stomach's sensitive. And, you know, when he's a little older, we'll give it to him. Well, he did, you know, as he got older, he, you know, became okay. But our youngest son, he, um, he's two and, uh, he's not quite two and a half. And same thing with him. And so we weren't exposing him to honey and peanut butter. Now, I want to ask you a question. Yes. In the course of these two case times with your family, even the one recently, mm -hmm. your children were very much aware that they were to avoid these things. Yes. So, for example... The parents were protecting them. For example, if our, my youngest son, you know, dug into a snack that, you know, was honey, if it was a honey cereal or something like that, all my other kids would literally freak out. He's in the honey, he's in the honey, or he can't have the peanut butter, you know, and, and all this stuff. And it's like, hey, you know, settle down. Not realizing we had really taught them that. And so I was having a conversation with you this week, this week, this week. and he's telling me all these things about peanuts. And I was like, well, you know, it's an opportunity here. Hey, I got a personal question for you. Uh, youngest son's got some diarrhea and things when he eats peanut butter and honey. And, um, you know, is that just kind of like a little thing? You know, he's going to grow out of it? Or is there actually something to that? Because I'm seeing other kids as age eating it and being fine. And you said, oh, absolutely, there's something to it. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready for this? Is how he said it. Are you ready for this? I said, sure. And so you spoke to some things in the generations, in, your family. in, in my family and everything. But um, you, you were talking about this subject the, the, you went through this article about the mass hysteria and everything. And I, I kind of knew right away. I was like, okay, so yeah, so there's this environment of fear. And I knew what I needed to do. So I went home and spoke with my wife and I said, hey, this, so this week. this week, yeah, Wednesday night. <laughs> okay, Wednesday night. There's another part of this you don't know that I really, it'll be good. So, <laughs> so I said, hey, I just, I want to talk to you about something, you know, this, you know, with, um, you know, Asher here, the whole nuts and peanut butter thing. I think, you know, we've, I was talking to Pastor Henry today, and I think we've created like an environment of fear around it. And at first she's kind of like, I don't know, you know, this and that. And I said, yeah, but I mean, just think about how our kids respond when he gets around it. They freak out. And she's like, oh, they do freak out. And so we, we, simp we repented, and, and this was like after they had gone to bed, so there wasn't big prayer and everything. We repented for it. We said, okay, and so I said, tomorrow, honey, I want him to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch. And she said, okay. Now, I'm telling you, this was a big risk for her. I'll tell you why. She's potty training this child this week. <laughs> 
Now, she could have easily said, look, when he gets the word potty train, let's go for this whole diarrhea thing. And, you know, lots on the line. If um, your furniture, your carpet, who knows? So, so there was a big risk. <laughs> you didn't know that part. <laughs> but she's a woman of faith. So we were both in an agreement. Uh, I went home that day for lunch and he was eating some honey. I said, here's a honey stick. You know, here's the other thing we did. We, we set our kids down that morning and we said, hey, we need to repent to you. Um, you know, we've, we've taught y'all that this peanut butter and honey is bad for your brother. And that's not how God thinks. Everything's good. And with uh, Thanksgiving and prayer, we can have anything. And uh, honestly, we repent to you because that's actually how the devil thinks about food. And that's not how God thinks about food. And so in this area, we have not taught y'all how to think like God about this food. Just, they got it. So, hey, if he gets around it, don't yell and scream. Just, it's fine. So we did that. And, uh, you know, I was texting my wife all day to kind of see. But <laughs> she get, we gave him honey sticks, gave him the peanut butter sandwich. And uh, nothing, no bowel movement for a while, which with diarrhea, it usually comes quick. Yeah. But when it finally did come, it was normal. So, and he sometimes would also get a little rash kind of around his eye, and that didn't happen either. So, you, you know, it, it wasn't difficult. He just had to go there and apply it. And it's not that it wasn't a battle, it was a, uh, she had a lot of overcoming to do, but she had the tools that we didn't have before, and the knowledge, and the wisdom, and we had hope again, yes. and God really uh, met us here and delivered us. For, uh, I think it was Psalm 34.4 was one of our, our verses that we wrote on the mirror in the bathroom that uh, we sought the Lord and He delivered us from all of our fears. All right, I'm Derek Brashear, and this is my wife, Melissa, and we're from Central Illinois. So we heard about being housed through a counselor that we had used years prior, and she knew something about it. And um, so we, that's how we initially found out about it. I went to her with uh, two verses. One was 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may uh, prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. And then the other one was Ephesians 6, 12, where it talks about, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the powers of the darkness of this age, and on it went. So with those two, she pulled out the white book and started to minister to me. And uh, that got me to the point where we decided, hmm, there's something to this being hell. And we decided to investigate it further on our own. And uh, that led us to Thomaston, Georgia. Well, if I had to describe our life before being health, I would say it was chaotic and disorderly. And we were living in fear. We were starting to lose hope for her health. Um, we were um, overwhelmed with our business because she needed a lot of care at the time. And um, I'll let you take it from there. I was pretty well isolated to my room. Um, we had gone to about five specialists trying to figure out what it was that I had. Um, and it, it boiled down to multiple chemical sensitivities and environmental illness. And uh, in the midst of our storm, um, uh, Derek ended up three times a day cooking for me, bringing the meals to my room. And if I was to leave my room, this is what I needed to do. I would put on these goggles and then put on this mask And that was to help tolerate what was in the air, what was in the environment, um, because I had become allergic to about 
everything in the air that you can think of. Chemicals, uh, bacteria, molds. In fear of, of being sick, not sleeping, and all the other symptoms that, that come with multiple chemical sensitivities, uh, this, this was always by my side. It had become part of me. <laughs> Oh, I'm tired. <laughs> Running a business, taking care of our son, we homeschooled, so I did most of that. I did the cooking, the cleaning, and uh, so when we heard about being health, it was, uh, it, we had tried all the doctors, and so we were starting to get some hope. I'm like, well, well let's at least try God. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. We've tried everything else, and we're Christians, and we're going to church, but uh, there was something uh, that was pulling us here. Um, what I got here uh, was really a connecting the dots for me. And one of the things that I remember uh, learning was that if you are going to go through this, it's a fight. It's a battle. And so I was prepared for that. I was so tired of living in this um, prison that that I had kind of formed, then, and the enemy helped me to form that, that I was ready to break through. And whatever that took, we were gonna do that together. We were gonna overcome this. And with Derek's support, um, we did. And I remember on the second day, uh, out of fear and, and wanting to control the environment, I uh, learned better I repented to Derek for ungodly order. <laughs> and by this point, he's really liking the program. <laughs> I'm not even there. so <laughs> He's at home watching our son. and um, But by, I, by day Friday, uh, I really didn't know what was going on. I thought, well, I hope she's okay and things are going along. And she calls and says on Friday, may I stay another week and go through the, the WOW program? And, and I said, well, if this is helping, by all means, please stay another week. And uh, we were glad she did. Yes. Oh. oh <laughs> <laughs> Freedom! Much better. <laughs> I, I, boy, you wish you had known about it about 20 years yes. ago. But um, just the freedom to just leave, for her, her just to leave the house and to actually participate in our family and not be isolated to a bedroom on the bed all the time, you know, sleeping. And so uh, we came out of a, um, a, a, just this bondage. And yes, right. she, she walked out very quickly uh, out the gate. And so she was driving places and going places she hadn't been in a year and within a week. And um, by five months later, our son could eat anything he wanted to eat, and he was reduced to five foods. And Melissa um, could go anywhere she wanted to go. And it's not that it wasn't a battle, it was a, uh, she had a lot of overcoming to do, but she had the tools yeah. that we didn't have before, and the knowledge, and the wisdom. And we had hope again. Yes. And God really uh, met us here, and delivered us. For, uh, I think it was Psalm 34.4 was one of our our verses that we wrote on the mirror in the bathroom that uh, we sought the Lord and He delivered us from all of our fears. I would say if you have any desire at all to come to Thomaston, Georgia, to follow it, there are amazing people here uh, that'll provide a safe place to connect with God in a way that maybe you have never connected before. I know it happened for us that um, not only did we find freedom and victory, we also found a love that keeps pulling us back to Thomaston, Georgia. <laughs> and um, God has something special for all of us. And this really is a place to discover what that is. I think when, when you're in the muck, um, when, when your wife is sick and your business is, is stressful and you're taking care of everything, it, you'll try anything. And uh, so 
so I, I, I just felt like my wife had a chance. And so uh, I'm, I'm glad she went and I, I don't know, I don't, how, what would I say to someone who uh, was a spouse? Just encourage them to come. And no matter what it takes to get them here, uh, I just sent her. I'm like, go. Oh. <laughs> well, you did some pounding on doors and praying for I me did. before, I did. which gave him the peace to say go. I had to uh, pray about my wife coming here to be in help, and everything was just lining up for her to come here. It wasn't that it was easy, and there were the enemy didn't want us here, um, but we just felt like this was the place where we were going to. I was going to finally hear the answer. I, I would like to encourage someone that um, has a sickness or an illness that God is no respecter of persons. He loves you and He wants you to have freedom too. That's why He sent His Son so that he, we could be free and that we could overcome. And what He has done for us and our family, our son was only able to eat five foods. And now that he can eat whatever he wants to eat, he's not bound in fear anymore. He's willing to take on adventures and try a roller coaster and go swimming and um, things that troubled him before. And that we have freedom in going to churches and being a family and traveling and not worrying. We were talking the other day that it almost seems like we were never sick. We're getting to that point where it's hard to remember what that was like because we have found freedom and we've just stuck with it. Yeah. And the enemies come against us and we just stick with what being health has taught us and we're able to overcome. And I got my wife back. <laughs> she got her life back. And we got our family back. Yeah. And it's, God it's just really, really restored, fun. God really restored us and gave us the tools to overcome whatever comes against us. I like to say God loves you. Yeah. He loves you more than, than we can even comprehend. And have the faith that if you take that step, He's going to meet you. And He knows what you need before you even start praying. So pray to Him and leave the consequences of your decision to come to Thomaston in His hands. Amen. And he'll take care of it like yes, he, he took care of it for us. Awesome. Awesome. Yes, um, it has been awesome. <laughs> God is good. Amen. <laughs>I can give you a testimony and say, well, but there's the live one. Um, very good point to be made that sometimes our problems are cross-pollinated. In other words, even our children sense our insecurities and fear. What I told David is that in actuality, you're trying to be a good parent by protecting your children when in fact you became the problem. Because you defied God's word, which was for their protection, because you made something evil. When the Bible says concerning food, there's nothing evil in itself. So what do you do with that? Do you, go, do you bend God's word to meet the manifestation? Or do you address the manifestation based on God's word? I'm just asking the question because we sometimes have difficulty believing because the symptoms demand we do something. I think this is a powerful testimony. And the fact that you removed that phobic atmosphere from your home will produce great dividends in your children in the future. And the parents, my, what good things this is for their health. Now they can do something important in life. I learned something from Job. Satan's ability to take out Job's children was given 
to the devil by Job. See, Job, you read the story of Job, Job's children were party animals. And they loved to party. And Job got concerned that in their partying, they would do something to offend God. And he began to hover over them. I help people all the time release children that aren't saved. Quit Bible thumping them. Quit, quit hovering over them in fear. You're enabling the enemy to drive them from God. Pray for them. Give them to God. It's a hard lesson because in the natural we think we're caring when in fact we may be enabling. And that's just something for you to consider today. And not every situation is different. Your lives are different. And I'm certainly not making this into a doctrine, but I'm certainly giving it to you as an observation. It worked in this family's case, and it's worked in many other people's cases, including adults. Now, I want to take this into one step further. I want to take the third part. We've dealt with traditional allergies that would show up under traditional IgE RAS test. We've spent a little time on understanding psychogenic allergies, having their origin in the human mind, without IgE um, activity, just hypersensitivity and other things coming out of thought. As I was meditating on this conference, and I've taught allergies for years, and I really could teach it as I've taught it for years, and we could have been done in one hour, or you could have bought the book. But as I was asking God, because my team sometimes asks me to teach on various subject matters, and they really stretch me. And, and so they asked me to do this thing on understanding allergies, and I went to my Father in Heaven, and I said, I know what you've taught me, and I know how it's worked, but I sense there's a depth to allergies that I need to know. And sometimes God will wake me up about 3.30 in the morning, and I hear thoughts begin to come. Like they're my own, but they're not. It's the Holy Spirit bringing me understanding. It happens over and over again. And I woke up about 3.30 a couple weeks ago, and here it came. And this conference unfolded in a moment, in a matter of moments. First, traditional allergies. I saw that. The second was psychogenic allergies. Now, I had not developed that as a specific teaching. I did embrace it a little bit here. There's more to it than you got, but I think you got the picture. The third startled me. Because what came in my mind is God said to me, I want you to develop the third type of allergy, and that's autoimmune disorders. I would never considered autoimmune disorders as an allergy, nor does science, until I started to study science. And I found in science the study of autoimmune disorders, and there's over 80 of them, that the immune system, the same immune system that's producing allergies, both IgE, RAST, and, and psychogenic, is using the same immune system. Something is using our immune system that's not recognizing the antigen marker on foods or whatever, or things that we're allergic to, but it's ignoring that. But something invisible is causing the immune system to recognize the antigen marker on your body parts. And the immune system decides that that body part is the enemy and begins to attack body parts and eat them or produce inflammation. 
And you can go down through the whole list. As, as I was looking at autoimmune disorders, and I'm familiar with quite a few of them, and I, I'll skip over here and, and give you a few to jog your memory, is alopecia. So women struggle with loss of hair. That's autoimmune. A diabetes type 1, not type 2, type 1. Graves disease, as opposed to... Um, as opposed to hypothyroidism, this is Graves' disease. Um, myasthenia gravis, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, it's called plastic skin, sojourn syndrome, multiple sclerosis, now, these are some of the autoimmune disorders that you are aware of, and you may have family members that have these disorders. I was shocked to find what kind of allergy that would allow God to ask me to include it in this conference. And I and I and the minute I thought about it, I knew it. The person is allergic to themselves as a person. Autoimmune disorders is that the body is attacking the body because the person is attacking themselves in their value system. It includes self-rejection, self-accusation, self-hatred, self-loathing. You're the enemy. Nobody loves you. And because you begin to attack your value system, if you're struggling with this self-accusation, I'm going to give you a prescription. No doctor can give it to you because he doesn't know how to, to handle autoimmune disorders. The medical community has no idea what to do with them. So if I were to give you a prescription, I would give you the prescription of Psalm 139. Because if you read Psalm 139, you'll find yourself in there and how God thinks about you. And if you don't agree with God, you're in self-idolatry. Because you know more than God. And you become your own counselor. And you're the source of your identity. You're going to find before you're ever conceived in the womb of your mother, the living father of all spirits knew you. And you're no accident. And in your generation, the Father sent his spirit to get you. You responded. Now, why would you doubt it? If God be for you, who can be against you? Why would we argue with our maker? Job tried that. He gave this whole discourse, and he began to accuse God, and, and God put up with it so long, and then he said, Mr. Job, shut up. Well, he didn't say that, but he meant it. Where were you when I did this? Where were you when I created the heaven? Where were you? Where were, where were you? Where were you? You know so much. Where were you when I did these things? My paraphrase, and Job said, shut my mouth. But God be true, the Bible says, and every man a liar. You have to embrace the fact that you are wanted. I don't care what your mother or father said to you. I don't care if you're put up for adoption. I don't care if you're an orphan. You're not an orphan anymore. And God has not given you the spirit of bondage again to fear, but of adoption where you can cry out, Abba, Father. You're going to have to get saved. I didn't say you weren't. I said, you're going to have to embrace what it means. When you got saved, you didn't become a Christian first. They're first called Christians in Antioch because they perceived they were followers of Christ. 
Yeah. When you became born again, you became a son and daughter of the Father of all living spirits, the Father God. And Jesus came that you could find him. And he found you. And you're wanted. Quit arguing the point. I'm just, I'm, I, I'm intense right now. I got to calm down. You don't have to suffer. Your body's designed to serve you, not attack you. I've given you your prescription. Read it over and over and over and over again until you embrace it. Then repent to God for hating yourself and rejecting yourself. If you're struggling with any autoimmune disorder, you're going to have to stop this self-accusation. It's the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. Why would you believe him and not believe the living God in Psalm 139? So I've given you the antidote. You got poison from Satan. I've given you the word of God to get you delivered. If you will believe God's word, believe it. There, I said it. Autoimmune disorders. Rejection of oneself and your identity. One of the big, I did a conference here a couple years ago. The name of the conference was, Who am I? Why am I here? And who cares? Because this is the battle I see even Christians dealing with. Who am I? We have an orphan's mentality. Why am I here? You haven't read your Bible in a long time if you don't know why you're here. And who cares? He cares. He cares. You don't have to get autoimmune disorders, and you can defeat them as quickly as they try to come if you've listened to this man talk to you. Now, I know autoimmune disorders. I help people with them all the time, and I know what guilt is, and I know what shame is, and I know what self-accusation, I know what self-hatred is, I know all the rest of it. But God taught me in the middle of the night that it's a self-rejection disease, all 80 of them. You've not accepted who you are in creation. You doubt it. Guilt, shame. You're always looking over your shoulder for somebody else's approval. Not getting it. You live in families that would, don't know how to love each other. Many of you have families that are Job's friends. They have all the answers for you, but they really are accusing you. You have a father. You have a father. Diabetes 1 is a disease coming out of rejection of a child by a father and abuse by a father. Every single time I have found it. Now make your peace with him. Let the other one go. Embrace the life of the true father in heaven. And the power of the devil is broken. And your immune system will stop attacking your pancreas and destroying the pancreatic islets that produce insulin. And then God, who is a God of miracles, will restore the pancreas, which doesn't heal, by the way. It's one of those parts of your body that doesn't heal. It's going to take a creative miracle. But the Father that we serve, the creator of all things through Jesus, is able to fix every pancreatic islet that the devil destroyed because of your battle with yourself, and give you a brand new pancreas like it was never diseased. You either believe that or you don't. I said, well, I'm from Missouri. I'll believe it when it happens. You'll never happen. It'll never happen for you. I believe it when I see it. That's not faith. 
So I want to leave you with this powerful thought about autoimmune. Let me just read to you about autoimmune. The test that they have, the blood test, show certain antibodies that are attacking your own healthy tissue. That's what happens in traditional IgE RAST allergies. That's what happens in psychogenic allergies. It's no different. It's just the antigen marker. May I submit to you that if you embrace the principles of death, the spirit of death will join you. You might as well fall out of agreement with death. Stop it. Stop it. Autoimmune diseases. This is some of the abstract stuff I printed off my computer. When the body's immune response turns against healthy cells. That's why it's of the class of allergies. What are antibodies? Any numerous Y-shaped protein molecules produced by B cells. Did I take you to the cortisol chart today? Did I show you that allergies was the result of a compromised immune system? Resulting in excessive B cell activity. Did I show you that today? In fact, to the degree your immune system is compromised, to that degree, excessive B cell activity occurs. It's an inverse sliding scale. You want B cell activity to quiet, then let your immune system be healthy. What destroys your immune system? In part, I learned it from the study of complex allergies. Proverbs 17, 22. I'm giving you a little review. A merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit, broken heart, dries up the bones. Rottenness of the bones is a Proverbs 14, verse 30, which is osteoporosis, which is coming out of envy and jealousy. Did we not read our Bible and see the connection between our spirituality and our health or disease of our bodies? I get so much sass from Christian leaders around the world who poke fun at me when I suggest that behind many diseases is a sin issue. And what they say is this, here's these poor suffering saints, hardly able to stay alive, and along comes this pastor that suggests they have a sin issue that's behind their disease. He's abusive. I'll tell you what Jesus said when he had just healed somebody. Go your way and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Unforgiveness is now known as a disease. Did you not read 1 John? That all unrighteousness is sin? Do you think that self-hatred is unrighteousness? Do you think self-accusation is unrighteousness? Do you think that self-bitterness is unrighteousness? Do you think guilt that you harbor is unrighteousness? Do you think that shame is unrighteousness? Do you think that unforgiveness is unrighteousness? Do you think that envy and jealousy is unrighteousness? Then it's sin. If the medical community is now saying that unforgiveness is a disease, and we know that unforgiveness is a sin, I don't have to look too much further but to quote science, to prove my point that the Bible in 1 John 5 is correct, that diseases coming out of unforgiveness are sin. We're in the dark ages. Christianity has no idea about what, how to solve the problem. And if prayer doesn't work, they don't know what to do next. 
I began when prayer wasn't working. And I found stuff in people's lives that gave power to the enemy. People wanted to be healed, but they didn't want to remove the thing that gave power to the enemy that produced the disorder. What purpose would it be for God to heal you unless you keep the thing that's causing the disease? You wouldn't keep your healing anyway. And he'd get blamed, and he knows it. Now, let me see what else I can about the understanding of autoimmune diseases. But sometimes problems with your immune system causes the immune system to mistake your body's own healthy cells as invaders and then repeatedly attacks them. This is called an autoimmune disease. An autoimmune means immunity against the self. There's acquired... And then there's innate. In this case, the immune system develops an intelligence or a memory. And the immune system in progressive autoimmune disorders, the immune system isn't just recognized in the antigen marker making that body part evil. It is programmed to make the body part evil all by itself because it has a memory. That's an intelligence. Spirits of infirmity are intelligent. One time before Jesus ever laid hands on, read your Bible, before he ever laid hands on to heal somebody, he first cast out the spirit of infirmity. Then he ministered healing. The church does not want to admit that there are evil spirits that are behind our problems. Somebody might become afraid of evil. So we lie. We're not truthful. We tell them God loves them anyway while they're dying. God loves you, period. But the prophet said that, and God said about his people, and the prophet Isaiah, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Whose people? Hosea the prophet, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And then the prophet said, because you have rejected knowledge. I'll reject you, you should no longer be a priest to me, and I'll forget your children, and there's your iniquity transferred. Folks, we can turn the tide if you're listening to this man talk to you. I'm not trying to bore you with facts, I'm trying to give you understanding you don't have to be a victim of disease. You don't have to be a victim of the enemy. God is more interested in you being changed into his image than healing you of your diseases. Because God knows if you'll be sanctified and changed into his image, you won't get the diseases that are coming your way. And the ones you have, he's now able to heal you. Did we not read our Bibles all the way through? There might be stuff in there that you need to know. Let me see what else I can tell you, and then I want to minister a little bit. I think I'm about done with autoimmune. I think I've made my point. There's some scriptures that I wanted to give you concerning fear of man. In Hebrews, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Why would you be afraid of men for? you afraid of their faces, their words? You don't have to be afraid of one other human. Yeah, but you don't know. Oh, yes, I do. But because they're that way doesn't mean I have to go down under it. I said to one person one time that was trying to victimize me with their evil, and I said, oh, baby, you're having a rough day. That was a wrong thing to say. What I got was you sanctimonious immigrant. Who do you think you are? That's what you get. So what? When I was afraid, 
I will trust in you. God, I will praise his word, and God, will I put my trust, I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. When I cry unto you, then shall my enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man shall do unto me. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear has torment. It fears that they may be perfect in love. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yea, I will help you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Now, these scriptures are not for repetition, wrote. They're to help you join God in your life. He wants to join you, the Holy Spirit. One of the most bored members of the Godhead is the Holy Spirit in the earth today. He's the power of the living Father. He undergirds the word of God in your life. He convicts you of sin. He leads you on to all truth. And he still needs your permission to say anything and do it. Give the Holy Spirit something to do. Please. He doesn't need to be so bored. It must be boring sometimes being the Holy Spirit in some Christians' lives. Poor Holy Spirit. What time I was afraid, I will trust in you. Another one in Isaiah. For I, I, for I, the Lord thy God, will hold your right hand, saying unto you, Fear not, I will help you. Psalms 118. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear what man can do unto me. Oh, I like this one. I've, I walked through this myself in, in 2011. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. My goodness, that's just good stuff. Be careful, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplications, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting your cares upon him, for he cares for you. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whosoever puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Let your heart not be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me, Jesus said. Be strong and of good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he is that doeth and goes with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you. I love Psalm 34. I sought the Lord. I've quoted this already here today. And he delivered me of all of my fears. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall fall to the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear you not, therefore, you are more valued than many sparrows. There's more to that, but I don't think they printed it right. That we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall put up, do unto me. Come up, Pastor Donna. For I will praise his word in God. I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh shall do unto me. For not, little flock, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. How great is your goodness, which you have laid up for them that fear you, which you have wrought for them that trust in you before the sons of men. The word of God is true, I believe it. You're not to lean in onto your own understanding. It could be dangerous but you're to put your trust in the Lord. In the next few minutes, I've asked Pastor Donna, my gorgeous hunk of dust, uh, <clears throat> to join me in a corporate ministry time. There is no distance in the spirit. <clears throat> For those of you that are here in this audience, those of you that are watching live streaming around the world, open your hearts. You've heard things today that the Holy Spirit wants to use. 
Many of you have identified with your own personal lives and your families. Some of you already have understanding of what to do next. Just as you heard the testimony of David Levitt, a little bit of understanding allowed him to go with his wife on behalf of his children and reverse something that they considered concern, but in fact was fear, and turned it into real knowledge, which was faith. And the results have been phenomenal. So many of you are thinking, and many of you have been so perplexed about allergies because you don't understand them. And I hope in this time that you've understood the nature of inherited, genetically inherited thought and, and allergies. You've understood the power of phobic thinking and how it affects you. And those of you struggling with autoimmune disorders, boy, there's hope for you today. Because you don't know what to do with it. Your doctors don't know what to do with it. And as we move through this, this time of prayer, when we get to autoimmune disorders, I want you just to repent to the Father if you have any autoimmune disorders, and repent to him for not accepting yourself in him. And just repent to him. You might be surprised that when you do that, the Father may send his Holy Spirit, still that immune system, and heal you of the effects of the autoimmune disorder. And that includes fixing the body parts that are already damaged. I believe that. I have seen it happen. But we have to trust our Father to do it. So we're going to ask the Father to come here in Jesus' name by his Holy Spirit and work with us today, here and there, to accomplish his goodwill. The Father knows your thoughts. He knows your fears. He knows the areas that you struggle with. He's not ignorant. He's not mad at you. He's your Father. He's not like an earthly father that you may think you're bothering him. You're not bothering him. He's expecting the conversation. You have not because you ask not. You're told to seek ye first the kingdom of your father and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I have not seen, hair has not heard, nor has it entered the heart of man which your father has prepared for them that love him. Folks, it's good to be sons and daughters of the living Father. I welcome you to your Father's house and his good pleasure. So Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. For those that are suffering from traditional allergies, we have learned that they inherited the genetic defect because they were part of families that were dysfunctional in love. Those families didn't know how to forgive. They didn't know how to love. They were families that were bound by performance, families that were bound by having to be somebody to be somebody. They didn't have the peace that they needed. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I speak, and I remind you of the words of Psalm 103, verse 3, Father, that you are the Lord, that forgives us of all of our iniquities, all of the transgressions of our forefathers. As they did in Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, when they understood, they confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Father, I ask as I speak into these families that those that are online around the world and those that are here that you will consider your family tree. You know, many of you, the battlegrounds. Many of you know the difficulties. I'm going to ask you to forgive these people in your families that didn't know how to love or accept you properly. Why should you have the plague? Because of their failure to represent love. So I give you a moment as I speak do, to do as they did in Nehemiah when they understood the reason for the captivity, they heard the reading of the word, as you have. They gave God thanks for teaching them. So, Father, we want to take a moment and give you thanks for teaching us today. Let's everyone just take a moment and give the Father thanks and worship 
for allowing us to understand. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We, we worship you, Father. We come to give you adoration and thanksgiving. We thank you for teaching us, letting your grace come and teach us today about such things. We thank you, sir, that dust like us is able to understand and be taught, that we may have knowledge and we may recover ourselves from the snare of the enemy who is taking us captive at his will. Well, we repent and we disenfranchise the enemy and say, you no longer control us. You no longer rule us. We're tired of your lies. We're tired of your voice. We're sons and daughters of the Father, and we're going to start acting like it. So, Father, we worship you, Lord Jesus. We give you thanksgiving and praise. And thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to the earth to make it possible for us to understand anything. And we give you all the honor and all the glory. Now, Father, we confess our bondage to fears. We confess to you that we have been superstitious at times. We have hovered around in our fears and our anxieties and our dreads. We admit to you that we have not known how to love perfectly. We have not known how to give or receive love without fear. And so we set ourselves up for the plague that the good things that you've created for us to be eaten the great smells of things that we make our lives so pleasurable that are taken away from us because of allergies by the enemy, that we want our life back, Father. We want what you created. We want the word to be fulfilled that in food there is nothing evil in itself. But all things are profitable of taking with thanksgiving because they're sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. Let not our prayer time at dinner time and so on be that of fear. Let it be a faith. And let us eat in faith, not in fear. So we repent to you, Father, and come to you for our participation with fear and ask you to forgive us. Help us understand. Teach us how to overcome. Release your Holy Spirit to bring us understanding when we dip back down under even our own memories, our own emotions or feelings, that the Holy Spirit will remind us, ah, you've gone there now, stop, not good for you, and that we'll snap back and say, not going there again. Father, we also understand the iniquities of the fathers can be visited the third and fourth generation even we're carriers of some of the allergies that our parents and grandparents had. And in some cases, our children and grandchildren already are carriers. We did what they did in Nehemiah. They not only confessed their sins, but they acknowledged and confessed the iniquities of their fathers. And we say to you, Father, that we're going to start a new dynasty of believing families. We recognize we, re, we, take a, we take responsibility for our lives and what's flowing in our generations. And we're going to teach our children and our children's children your ways that we can be free and start a family tree, not of the plague, but a family tree of blessings. Father, give us hearts to understand this pathway and this understanding in Jesus' name. Now, I come against all genetic impurity that produces allergies that are showing up in traditional IgE RAS tests. Father, to those that are here, those that are watching live around the world, I speak into your genetics. I speak the genetic impurity be reversed. I come against the temptation of thought that's traveling in the family tree that would undergird this way of thinking, that would produce the genetic code defect, and I say, you're a lying kingdom. And we recognize you, and we've repented of the Father, and you no longer control us, and you no longer have permission to put the plague on us. And we resist you. Now, Father, those that need the genetic change, that we release them from the traditional allergies, I ask you, Father, now in Jesus' name, to honor their faith, and the simplicity of their hearts, and believe you will do that in Jesus' name.
Now, Father, I come against the spirits of fear that are producing phobies, phobias and superstitions of fear. The training of the human mind to be phobic. The long-term memories that are plagued and then being around people that reinforce it with their fears. And so we become people of fear. And then our bodies are reacting to our minds because our minds aren't stayed on the Lord. We're not holding every thought captive. We're not casting down imaginations. We are just like following the Pied Piper, and we don't know where he's going. You've not called us to delusional thinking. You've called us to have the mind of Christ. You've told us that we're to have God's word. You're told that even though we have an enemy, we're to be wiser than that enemy, enemy, or to be wiser than a serpent, but harmless as a dove. Father, we ask you to help us renew our mind. We ask that our long-term memory be, that be, we begin to hold those thoughts captive, and that our bodies no longer react to these phobic thoughts. We repent to you for creating an atmosphere of fear in our families, an atmosphere of dread, an atmosphere of of hopelessness, an atmosphere where we really have reinforced the works of the enemy and we call it love. We actually have become codependent with the enemy in the name of love and we didn't realize it that we've created an atmosphere of dread and fear, not faith and freedom. And so, Father, we ask you to help us right now have our minds renewed. We're told in the Word of God that our minds are renewed by the washing of the water of the Word. Give us a hunger for your Word again. Give us a hunger to know your mind. Because your mind is superior, Father, to the mind of a fallen archangel and his kingdom. We repent to you, Father, for following the wisdom and the genius of a fallen kingdom that has been trying to influence us through temptation. We have been listening. We repent to you for listening to the lies of the enemy. We receive our forgiveness. We ask you to lead us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And thank you, sir, for hearing our prayer. Now, for those that are struggling with their identity, those that are struggling with autoimmune disorders, those in which the body is attacking the body as the enemy, those that have not accepted themselves, that are acting as orphans, even though they, when they became born again, became legitimate sons and daughters, not illegitimate, but legitimate sons and daughters. For it is written, we've not been given the spirit of bondage again to fear, but of adoption, whereby we can cry out, Abba, Father, Dad. Father God, we are your children. Now, Father, you have created us for your pleasure. As it says in Revelation chapter 4, that the, that the Father of all spirits, he has created all of things and has created us for his pleasure. Father, we respond to you, not to the fallen son, Satan. He was a son, and he rebelled against you, and he's trying to get us to rebel against you so he can plague us. We repent to you, Father, for listening to the devil. We repent to you for arguing about our identity. We repent to you, Father, for rejecting ourselves. We repent to you for rejecting who we are in you. For it is in you we live. It is in you we move. It is in you we have our being. And we accept our sonship. We accept our daughtership. We're sorry that we're acting like orphans when we are the seed of greatness of all of eternity. After the order of Melchizedek, rulers, kings, and priests, and we shall rule and reign, we're somebody by faith in Jesus' name. We're not stepchildren. We are true children. We are the children of creation. We are the children of the resurrection. We are the children of faith. And we believe it and accept it. Those immune systems that are out there attacking people and autoimmune disorders, you stop it. Stop it. Oh, Father, I ask you that the damage that was done by the immune system to all these various body parts 
as the people respond to you, Father, this day, that, Father, in Jesus' name, by your Spirit, you will come and fix the body parts that don't heal, that were destroyed. Father, put new body parts in place. Put new pancreases in place. Put new joints in place. Take away all the damage done by this immune system. And not only forgive them, heal them. Restore them for your glory in Jesus' name. And we thank you, sir, for hearing our prayer. And we give it to you and the increase in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow, what amazing truth. We know that God, our Father, has met you and will continue to meet you. This is only the beginning. But I hope you realize during the conference, it is so much more than just healing of allergies, but it is the healing of our hearts. You know, if you're new to Be In Health, I encourage you to get to know us a little bit more. And you can do that by checking out our website, signing up for our weekly emails and blogs, or liking our Facebook page. And if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, you can do so by clicking the subscribe button and then clicking the bell next to it to get notified whenever a new release comes out. Also, don't forget that all Be In Health resources are 20% off today until midnight. That is a great savings to you, and you can get a copy of this conference, Overcoming Allergies, in CD format. Remember, we are offering our For My Life online course for $100 off today. Click the For My Life link below to register. And lastly, thank you so much for hanging with us to the end. At times throughout the conference, you may have seen links pop up, giving you an opportunity to support Be In Health financially. This will help extend further the mission that God has called us to here at Hope of the Generations Church and Be In Health. We are a debt-free organization that operates on faith and the faithful support of many precious people to get this job done. It's not too late to give. There's a link in this video that will direct you to our giving page. And with that, God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Having the For My Life program online has been kind of a dream of ours because, you know, not everybody can come here at this time or any time. Maybe, maybe you're too sick or, or maybe just your life circumstances won't allow you to do that. I don't want you to think you're, feel, you're being cheated because you're not able to come here. God will meet you in a most amazing way. But the For My Life online to me is a very intimate time with the Lord. What I mean by that is, you know, some of my greatest breakthroughs with God have been in my prayer closet, or it's been I've heard something or I've read something in the scripture, and I didn't have the distractions of anyone around me to be able to thwart maybe what God was wanting to do in my life. It's also a time for the Holy Spirit to reveal to you things of your past that brought you to the present, and, and, and he, that he can be able to speak to you and convict you and show you things that maybe you've never seen before. Because I know that when you hear these teachings, you are going to hear things that, yes, you may have read so many times or maybe never, but, they're, the, but, but God's gonna ignite something in the times that you hear this. And you are going to be able to just totally surrender to him, vulnerability and also humility. Also, too, because you're reflecting on the past that brought you to the present, we also give you hope for the future. The thing is, is that before God, He begins to ignite things in that be still and know that I am God moment, where He shows you, oh my goodness, I have tools to overcome forever and ever. For as long as I'm here on this earth, I can overcome. So I really hope that you consider taking the For My Life online, not for us, but for you.